So three, let's test this fiber isolated oscilloscope probe donated by Saker. So big thanks for the donation. And it's really fiber isolated or optically isolated, not a differential probe. And thus it should perform better. It should have a higher common mode rejection ratio than a differential probe. Here's this probe with the cable for the oscilloscope. Here's the output, the input. This handle for it. A screwdriver for adjustment, for the offset and gain. And some cable and attenuator. Time is 10. A quick look at some information and numbers. It can measure the floating gate voltages, thyristor gates, floating current shunts or bipolar junctions, a common mode voltage up to 1200 volts, a 200 MHz bandwidth, 10 kV isolated, and a BNC output in 250 ohms. And here it says it can connect to any oscilloscope, reliable floating measurements. During research and development, semiconductors can short, which puts the real voltage to the gate. But it shouldn't destroy this probe because it can withstand 350 volts. And some table, 200 MHz bandwidth, 1 mega ohm, 10 picofarads, 1.8 nanosecond rise time. The probe input voltage plus minus 2 volts, but more with attenuators. Here's the common mode voltage, some noise, 9.5 nanoseconds delay, 1 to 5 output input ratio, the non destructive voltage 350 volts. Isolation 1 second 10 kV and the common mode rejection ratio for different frequencies and finally the size and the weight. But now of course everybody wants to see it in operation so let's test it. Let's give it a test signal first. The signal goes via this into the attenuator or divider, dividing the signal by 10. Then into this isolated probe module and then into an oscilloscope through this cable. This requires a power supply of 5 volts. It has a USB cable, so I will use a USB charger, of course. And a simple test source. It will produce a square wave going between 0 volts and 5 volts at a 25% duty cycle. It's actually an inductance meter, but it doubles as a test signal source. And the output of this has to go into an oscilloscope with a 50 ohm termination. Of course, not every oscilloscope has this. You can insert a terminator between this and the oscilloscope, but I'm actually going to use an oscilloscope which does have a 50 ohm option for the input. Or a built-in 50 ohm termination which you can activate. I have this Tektronix oscilloscope where the inputs can be switched between 1 mega ohm and 50 ohms. Channel 1, menu, and you can switch 1 mega ohm or 50 ohms here. Let's plug this thing in. I'm giving it the test signal. Of course I have to switch this and I can actually see it here. Change the level for the trigger and it displays the signal nicely. Now of course the attenuator is times 10 and this thing is times 5 so in total times 50. So I have to set the probe times 50 and now it's 2.5 volts per division and 2 divisions so it's 5 volts. So it's right. Or now it's one division, 5 volts per division, so it's again 5 volts. So it seems to be well calibrated. 1 volt per division, and it's 5 divisions again for 5 volts. It seems to be working well. Now let's compare one channel going through the isolated probe and the other channel going through a regular probe. Maybe a tiny gain difference which I could actually adjust. Adjusting it, that's it. Now let's zoom the rising edge. Both have some ringing, which seems to come from the signal source rather than the isolated probe, because the regular probe shows about the same, except the slight delay in the isolated one, the yellow one. There is about 4 or 5 nanoseconds difference, but even the regular probe might have some delay, which is subtracted from the difference, and the race time seems to be virtually the same. And of course the signal source might be the limiting factor here, it's just a simple square wave oscillator. Of course I've used the oscilloscope to adjust the offset, you should adjust it on the isolated probe. Now that's it. Let's zoom the edge once more. Then switch it to the falling one. That looks quite similar. Except there is some ringing before the transition here. Here you can see both probes connected to the output of the chip in the square wave oscillator. This is the probe I'm using for the comparison. This oscilloscope allows me to disk you the delay of the probe, so I select this and I can actually move it so both probes are aligned with no time difference between them. 
Here the difference seems to be 4.5 something nanoseconds. You can compare the rising edge now, which is about the same. And you might be asking what happens if the termination is actually 1 mega ohm. It was actually at a different scale, but other than that it looks very similar. Not really that much happens. And the falling edge with the wrong termination. I was expecting the wrong termination to cause more distortion. Well, there is an overshoot here, beyond this level, with the right termination, definitely not that much overshoot, and of course not at the same scale. As for comparison, let's overshoot with the right termination. Now of course I should do some real life test, ideally on a floating gate MOSFET in a switching power supply. I recently came across this free television, which is still working and it seems big enough to have something more than just a flyback in it. Using a camera as a test signal source. It runs. Nice. Here's the back of it without the cover and there's really not much of it in it. Here's the board with the tuner and the processors and all these things we are not interested in. And here's the interesting part, the power supply. Here's the label on the back cover. 130 watts, which is actually a good thing because it's more than you typically get from a flyback power supply. We're interested in a power supply with a floating gate MOSFET. So we don't want to fly back or a single switch forward. We need something like a half bridge bridge or two switch forward. Here's the power supply unit with the typical components, the fuse, metal oxide varistor for over voltage protection, and TC thermistor for inrush current limitation, some X capacitors for interference suppression, some inductors, another X capacitor, some Y capacitors. Here's the bridge rectifier, but it doesn't go straight into the electrolytic capacitor on the primary side. It goes into just a polypropylene film capacitor, so there is a power factor correction. Here's probably the power factor correction inductor, the power factor correction switching transistor and the diode. Or maybe this is the power factor correction diode and this is the inrush diode. Bypassing the ultrafast diode and the inductor for the inrush current. And here seems to be a half bridge of transistors, MOSFETs. Some film capacitor maybe in series with the half bridge output going into a transformer. This might be the main transformer. This is some auxiliary flyback power supply transformer together with this thing, which looks like a transistor but it has five pins. So it's basically a flyback switching transistor and a control circuit in one. There are two optocouplers, which you probably can't see from this angle. Then some small current sensing transformer probably. On the secondary side some rectifying diodes and capacitors. And then the high voltage transformers because it's a CCFL panel, not yet LED. And the typical high voltage capacitors in series with the tubes. Now of course the main point is to see the waveforms on the gates of these transistors in the half bridge on the primary side. The lower one in the half bridge has its drain connected to the negative of the rectified mains, so it's not isolated from mains, but it doesn't have any high frequency voltage on it. The gate of the upper one is even trickier to measure because the source has several hundred volts of a high frequency voltage on top of the mains voltage. To measure the gate of the lower one you don't necessarily need an isolated probe, you can just run the appliance on an isolation transformer and then you can still connect a grounded oscilloscope to it with a regular probe. But measuring the gate of the upper one is even trickier because the internal capacitance of the isolation transformer and all the stray capacitances are way too high for the high frequency voltage. So even with an isolation transformer it's not possible to measure the gate of this one, the upper one. To see the waveform on the gate of this one, an isolated probe is absolutely essential. You could maybe use a battery powered oscilloscope, which is not grounded, but still its capacitance can skew the measurement, plus the multiple hundred volts of the high frequency voltage could damage the oscilloscope, and on top of it all the safety problems of floating your oscilloscope at a dangerous voltage. I might actually try to measure one transistor gate or the other using the isolator probe. To measure both gates simultaneously, I would ideally use two isolator probes, but one should be enough if I use the isolator one for the upper one and a regular one for the lower one while operating the television on an isolation transformer. The source of this one only has mains voltage on it. This one has the mains voltage on the source plus the high frequency voltage superimposed on it. Let's use a 200 volt amp isolation transformer to power the television so that the primary side of the power supply is not referenced to mains and the probe going to the lower MOSFET can be a regular probe. This draws 0.37 amps. I expected a bit more, but anyway. Here's a very simplified schematic of the power supply. The mains comes in here, some interference suppression filter and inertia limitation and over voltage protection. Here's the bridge rectifier. 
the film capacitor, the power factor correction with its switching transistor inductor, ultra-fast diode and inrush bypass diode, the big electrolytic capacitor on the primary side, and then the half bridge of MOSFETs, which probably goes via DC decoupling capacitor, maybe a resonant capacitor into the primary of the main transformer. The secondary has some type of rectification and smoothing. It might have more outputs, I'm drawing just one for simplicity. And we're interested in the gates of the MOSFETs and the waveform on them. Of course you have to measure the gate of this MOSFET in reference to its source, and the gate of this MOSFET in reference to this source. So the tips of the probes go to the gates, and the ground clips would go to the sources, but you can't use two regular probes with a multi-channel oscilloscope, because the ground clips are actually interconnected. If I connected the ground clips of the probes here and here, it would basically cause a short circuit and basically bypass this transistor. So at least one of the probes has to be isolated. You can use a grounded probe here, put an isolated one here. And of course to use a grounded probe here, I have to use an isolation transformer to power it. Here I'll have to demonstrate this for the beginners. Two regular non-isolated probes connected to an oscilloscope. Now the grounded clips are actually interconnected. If you connect these two to different points in the circuit, you cause a short circuit between the points. And they're also connected to the ground or earth of your wall socket. So to measure both gates in a half bridge, on the primary side you either have to use two isolated probes, or one isolated probe here plus an isolation transformer here. Let's build some adapter for this. Do I actually have to show this process? The heat shrinks. That's it. Now it's connected. I really hope it's not going to touch more than I want it to touch. And that's the waveforms. But when I capture just a single shot, it shows this. Occasionally this. I zoom it out. Is it running in a burst mode? Oh hell yes! It's turning the gate drive off about every 6 or 7 milliseconds. And this might be because the backlight brightness is not at maximum. Let's run. Zoom it in. And a single. That's the gate drive when it's actually running. 64 kilohertz, basically alternately switching the transistors on. It's 5 volts per division, so both gates are getting at the peak about 12 volts. That's the gate waveforms of two transistors in a half bridge. And you can see both of them simultaneously for the first time. This is something impossible without an isolated probe, or differential probe at least. Nice! If this connects the probes, put it upright so that the backlight is to maximum. Now it actually draws more. And now at the full brightness of the backlight, the half bridge is actually running continuously, not in a burst mode. Zooming it out and you can see a continuous envelope. So basically the entire half bridge power supply operation is pulsing with the backlight pulsing. Which means everything else has to be powered from a different power supply. All the control circuitry, the processors, the tuner. And these are probably powered by the other power supply, probably flyback with this transformer and this chip. And because the gate signal isn't a perfect square wave, I guess it goes via a gate draping transformer, which is probably this one, so it's not a current sensing transformer. If the gates of the half bridge MOSFETs were driven directly using some chip, the gate waveforms would be more square, the top would be flat, and also the rise and fall would be more steep. The leakage inductance of the gate driving transformer makes these waveforms a bit more crappy, but still definitely good enough for the purpose. Now let's connect the isolated probe to the gate of the MOSFET in the power factor correction. And I'm using just one channel, just the isolated probe, so the TV can be plugged in directly without an isolation transformer. Power factor corrections are always tricky to measure, because the switching frequency is modulated by the 100Hz ripple. This is the envelope, and when I zoom it in, it seems to be a variable frequency. When I make a single measurement, it's every time different, based on how much of the voltage comes from the bridge rectifier at the moment. The frequency can be anything from about 46 kHz, all the way to about 160. It seems like a constant on time, and a variable of time. And finally the current sensing resistor of the power factor correction. Its voltage drop is quite low, so I'm measuring without the alternator. The waveform is a sawtooth, as expected, basically. 
and of course every time a bit different as it's riding. The whole focus of the rectifier main is without smoothing. This is the power factor correction MOSFET and the current sensing resistor I was measuring on. So that's this isolated voltage probe. Definitely a very useful tool. There will probably be a link in the description. And again big thanks for the donation and if you like my videos please consider subscribing, supporting my channel on Patreon or using the thanks button. And big thanks to all of you who already support me. You keep this crazy channel running.